Welcome to a care collab on a species that is just darling, a little miniature orchid that has actually been blessed with a proper name, Leptotis bicolor. Leptotis from the Greek translates into delicateness. And yes, that is what I consider a perfect name for this orchid. She is delicate, but only visually. She is actually a very robust little orchid. So don't let the translation of the name put you off. Leptotis bicolor is pretty, pretty tough. And can handle some form of abuse or another to a certain degree. I will be telling you how I care for mine. You see I have two. I will get into that as well. The thing with the delicateness does not only refer to the growth habit but also the bloom structure. And still one more reference to the delicateness is the fact that the seed pods of this species were at one time used to produce a vanilla-like flavoring for ice cream specifically, but then that extended to the use for the seed pods in cookies and other baked goods, also flavoring milk back in the day. And this reflects in the fragrance of the blooms. There is a note of vanilla there, which isn't like the vanilla that you would smell from a vanilla ice cream. It's like the extract of vanilla that you get for your baking goods. So you do get the vanilla hit when you smell the orchid, but if you were to have vanilla extract and you smell that and you know you just take two or three drops to improve any kind of vanilla flavoring, then you know that it smells of vanilla, but then it moves onto something else because it's a concentrate. So that is what this orchid smells like. It is not an obvious fragrance. You have to stick your nose in it, at least here in my climate in southern Spain. It's not like my surroundings are wafted with the vanilla fragrance so it's also a very delicate fragrance. The species blooms from late winter to summer so my timing here is perfect with one of mine and the other one is also perfect because you can see the buds are still forming. So the time frame late winter to summer also gives us a hint as to how long lasting the blooms are easily two months. They hold their shape and their color even though they're white but normally we know that many times an orchid that blooms white as the blooms age. The first thing to show signs of aging is the white of the bloom. Not so with the Leptotis bicolor. They also hold the fragrance for this considerable amount of time and considering how delicate they are I think that's pretty pretty impressive. <laughs> The added beauty about these blooms is also the fact that they are much larger than what you would expect from a ratio of the size of the orchid. In a way, you could say they're out of proportionally large, but we don't complain about large blooms, especially when it comes to miniature orchids that normally then favor teeny tiny blooms that we have to look at with a magnifying glass. Leptotis bicolor, not at all. Big blooms for the size of the orchid. There's one thing though, patience is a must from the moment that you see that a spike will develop, always at the apex of a leaf. Very Brassavola-like, but the spike itself doesn't get very long. It's the peduncles that then take forever to get to a length before the bud actually blooms out. So that can take anywhere from three to four months. So if you're excited about seeing a Leptotus spike, let's say late fall, and you think that by Christmas you're gonna have blooms, that is not going to be the case. You will probably have to wait until late winter, early spring. As in my case, the one on the right only started to bloom out four weeks ago. So those blooms are four weeks old and for a white orchid, yeah, I think the color still looks amazing. And the one on the left started much, much later. So I will have a successive blooming of Leptotis bicolor. I think that's also pretty amazing. <laughs> Naturally, they are found in subtropical rainforests and coastal mountains of Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. This makes them very, very temperature tolerant as well. The temperature lows where I grow mine indoors in the grow space they drop to 14 degrees Celsius, whereas in the summer, the same space can go up to 40 degrees Celsius, although that is very rare, it will happen. But when we talk about subtropical rainforests and coastal mountains, one thing I don't have which they would really prefer is humidity. My yearly average of 30% makes it impossible for me to grow them mounted, a setup which works really well for them. But they would draw on high humidity to thrive and grow well if mounted. 
and for that reason, I opted for inorganic media and self-watering. This gives the orchid a perimeter of high humidity just around its own pot. I am playing with the evaporation process of the moisture-retentive media to amp up the humidity, giving the delicate growths some reprieve. So if you are in a dry climate like mine, where your humidity never stays consistently above 50%, potting this orchid up works really, really well. This orchid is a perfect candidate if you have an orchidarium or some kind of enclosed space where there's regular misting to amplify the humidity. So if you're saying, well, my orchidarium, my case, my display is pretty full, I can't fit another orchid in, this Leptotus bicolor, being so small in size, I'm sure there is a wonderful little corner that could do with a touch of color every once in a while. And that is the beauty of this orchid. She can really fit in somewhere. She doesn't take up much space. Her growth habit is not rambling. Even her rhizome stays nice and compact. Okay, so let's get into the two different ones that you can see that I have, including different media. The first one that I got was this one right here which I potted up in Ceramus after I got it wrong with the Lekka ratio when she first arrived. I first had her mounted and then realized very, very quickly when she was teeny tiny even that my growing her mounted would not be successful at all in my climate and that is when she was tiny. So I put her into Lekka and self-watering. But at the time, I did not respect the roots. The roots are super, super fine. They're almost oncidium-like, but they have a cattleya kind of growth pattern. So I had to accommodate for fine roots, and that is why my first one went into Ceramus. The reason I have a second one is because my first one gave me suspicious little vibes that there's something wrong with her secondary issues. I didn't want to risk it and I was very very lucky to get a beautiful shipment from a Cairn Orchids in Belgium via Tokyo World Mark and I got myself a replacement for all eventualities on this Leptotus bicolor which is this one here and you can see the difference in the size of the leaves as opposed to what mine is that I've had now four years and this one only arrived last summer. So there was a suspicion, something was wrong. I was proven somewhat right that the Leptotus bicolor here is not as happy as this one right here. And this one went straight into very small Lekka. I separated that out and self-watering. I did a transition video on her, specifically targeting how to transition from organic to inorganic media. And as an update, this orchid is rooted in. We will get to fiddling around with the wire just now. Keeping the media very, very small allows for the media to be much more water retentive and that helps the roots also to not dry out. There is no wet dry cycle in this setup. I water by flushing regularly, especially when these orchids are not in active growth. Keeping the media damp is paramount so that it doesn't turn around and draw moisture from the roots because of being too dry. Damp is a good status quo for this orchid, even when not in active growth. But when I do add fertilizer, it's because new growths are on the way. Seeing as she's a miniature and has fine roots, I do not want salt buildup forming on the surface of my media. I am conservative with my fertilizer and I apply 100 parts per million every time the reservoir is close to the point of empty. The flush between filling up the reservoir is important to keep the surface salt free. I am also very conservative on the supplements with CalMag and seaweed. I do that once a month. A total of 100 parts per million is what I apply using 40 parts per million with seaweed and 60 parts per million would be CalMag. Once I see that the blooms are showing signs of fading, I encourage whatever else the orchid is getting ready to do, moving the hormones to new growth points by applying seaweed only. And all that it takes is just one application of seaweed only because seaweed has the hormones and I push them into the orchid, sort of giving her a nudge saying, I know what you're about to do. Here's a little bit of help to encourage you to start it a little bit sooner. I just do that once with seaweed only and then the rest of the time it'll always be seaweed and cow mag when not in active growth. And that includes, from my perspective, new roots. I only flush. So now you may say, well, what is going on if you're so conservative with your fertilizer? Maybe she needs more fertilizer because look at the growths that I grew and look at the growths she came with. Same here, for example. Look at the new growth that is blooming on this one, how tiny it is. And again, this orchid was always very, very small and not really Leptotus-like at all. 
So my observations on this orchid right here are twofold. Before I amp up the fertilizer to see if I can't get the original size growths back, I want to make sure that she is actually not acclimating and on top of that, not only transitioning. After a transition period, an orchid may produce stunted growths and that is normal. She has a lot to deal with, new roots, new media, acclimating, she's new to the environment, etc. So that could be one reason. The second reason could be I don't have enough humidity even with this setup. So the orchid will only perform according to what her environment provides. It could be that in my climate, all I have will always have small needles. Once she has acclimated, which is now the case, she is completely rooted in after the transition. My tug test tells me so. The next set of growths, I can possibly up the ante and go with 160 parts per million to make sure that I am giving her enough fertilizer so that she can grow to her full potential. If by chance then, in a year's time, she does not grow to full potential, then the humidity is a big, big factor because this orchid needs at least 60 to 80% consistently year in, year out. So I'm working at the moment with these two orchids. This one used to get 160 parts per million, but it made absolutely no difference. I still have a stunted growth. My priority in my setup is to avoid any form of salt buildup. So I'm not going to go all ninja and try to create these beautiful lengthy needles. If mine will consistently stay small, then that is fine by me as well, as long as she's happy, healthy and alive and blooming. And while I was talking, I was removing the wire that I had her in place with using the support after her transition repot, and you can see just how many blooms are coming out of the middle here. Even some of the roots grew upright into and up through the leaf. That's fine, I'm not concerned about that. But now that I've released her, there are so many more options for blooms to bloom out. This orchid is already vigorous in the time period that I've had her, not even a year, as opposed to this one that I've had for four years. So I'm hopeful that this orchid is going to stay in my collection, whether I up the fertilizer or not, no matter the length of her growth. And this one is a healthy one, and this one we shall see if it will grow out of its issues. And you can see the difference between the two as well, because I have freckles on one and not on the other. These dots up here are not to be mistaken with freckles. They came with some of these freckles and I believe they have spread a little bit, but not much. Now I don't have any spreading. The freckles are the anthocyanin, giving us the signal that the orchid is getting enough light to bloom. Anthocyanin is also a sign of stress with too much light, but it can also be a sign of scar tissue, so to speak, where anthocyanin forms around scar tissue. If an orchid that doesn't have that much anthocyanin tendencies shows anthocyanin, then it also shows that there are secondary issues in that orchid. And I don't want to use the word, I don't want to jinx it, but it could be the F-bomb. The two of them, speaking of light, live pretty much next to each other throughout the year. They get the same level of light. They live indoors consistently in my climate because I don't want them in any kind of direct sun. My sun is much, much harsher here in southern Spain than it would be in northern latitudes. And clearly you can see that the more vigorous and the more healthy of the two has no issues blooming abundantly with the level of light I'm giving, which is considered bright, bright shade. During the winter, they're a little bit further back on the rack because the angle of the sun will hit them directly and that's not a problem. It's far too weak to cause any issues. During the summer, they're right up against the glass because the angle of the sun is so high, no sun hits them at all, ever. This orchid also did not bloom for me in 2021. I had a fabulous blooming in 2020, and it's almost as if she needed another year just to acclimate and pick up her stride. And that's a clear sign for me that something's not quite right with her. This one right here didn't skip a beat. Arrived in my collection, I kept her in the media she came in, I waited for new roots to come. I cleaned her up, I put her into small lecker, and well, ta-da, everything in one go. And that is the difference between an orchid that is possibly affected by something and an orchid that is super healthy. I am really glad that I have a second Leptotus here to be able to compare the performance of the two, not meaning that one is doing better in lecker and the other one not so well in Ceramus. The reason I haven't switched over this Leptotus right here into the small Lekka is because I don't want to disturb her. 
I want her to get established. I want to figure out if something is going on. If I keep messing with this orchid, I don't have a baseline. I can't watch, observe her and see about her progress. That was a little bit of a tangent, but anyway, I've had no pest issues with any of these orchids. I don't have scale, no aphids, considering how sweet this orchid is, also producing a little bit of happy sap here and there, the fragrance of that vanilla, nothing. Thank goodness, not complaining, just saying. She doesn't seem to be a pest magnet. That's not a label that would apply to her. <laughs> Considering that this orchid is a miniature, this video turned out to be quite long, but you can tell that I'm quite fascinated by this one. And being able to grow two in different phases of vigor makes it even more interesting. And I hope that this video was interesting for you, especially if you're reading up about this orchid and hearing how much high humidity she needs and hearing that they grow best mounted and you don't have humidity. Well, here's the proof. They work in a pot, in Lekka and self-watering without a wet dry cycle. And I hope that encourages you to get one if you've considered it, but shied away from it and enjoy growing an orchid that looks like a Brassavola, but isn't. <laughs> Really, really appreciate you sticking to the end of the video. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you to all the channels that participated in this care collab. I have the links to those channels in my description, other setups, other environments, lots of options. If you're still a little bit on the edge, on the fence, whether you really want to go inorganic with a self-watering setup for an orchid that would sound a little bit finicky, but really she isn't. Thank you so much for watching my video. Thank you for your time. I wish you a very, very beautiful day. On one condition though, <laughs> that you stay safe. Take care, bye.